Hello everybody, welcome to Austin Westy Bucket. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and drop a like on this video. I am trying to hit 80,000 subscribers on this channel by the end of the year, so your subscription would be much appreciated. Also drop a like on this video, it only takes one second and it makes a massive difference. Uh, as I mentioned in one of the more recent videos, this is the uh, same outfit whole way through because I'm recording multiple videos consecutively. And today's video is a video that I talked about on my most recent main channel video upload at the time of this video being recorded. I've said video like 15 times in this video already. Uh, that video was about, fuck. <laughs> it was about the Bulls and uh, their doubters. And I talked about an article at the end of that video, which was Bleacher Report's article by Zach Buckley, which came out August 11th, so before the season started, ranking the 10 worst signings of 2021 free agency. So this is a list, after free agency had happened, ranking all of the worst uh, signings that had happened. This article did not age well. And we're going to talk about it. So there are some not awful takes. Uh, and in general, I will say 90% of the time when someone says this signing was bad, it really isn't that big of a deal. Contracts that are perceived as untradeable are very rarely the case. And players that are not that great don't usually get crazy big contracts. Most of the time, a reason a contract ends up being bad is because it's a contract based on potential or based on that player being healthy and then that player gets injured, that player doesn't reach their potential, and then they end up being kind of eh with the money of a player that was expected to be better. But if you're signing someone at the time expecting him to be this player, I can't really fault you for that contract. Like John Wall's contract is one of the worst in the NBA now, but this extension that he got at the time was within reason. Like he was a 15, top 15 player in the league and he got paid like a top 15 player. And then he had a series of unfortunate events. So almost always it's an overreaction. Uh, very, I think teams now are very in tune with what is a good and bad signing. I'm not saying there aren't overpays, I'm not saying there aren't mistakes, but even if those mistakes do exist, they're not that drastic. So it's not that big of a deal. I swear to God, some NBA fans and analysts act like you overpay a role player by $5 million and they act like that's just gonna ruin your franchise for two seasons. It's like, calm the fuck down. So uh, speaking of overreacting to players making a lot of money, uh, Chris Paul at number 10. Uh, he got a four-year, $120 million extension, which is paying him $30 million per year. Uh, the argument there, of course, is just that he is going to be 40 before the contract is up. And I do see that reasoning, but it was kind of a situation like the Chris Middleton contract extension where it's like you kind of have to do it and long term it's worth it for the overall implications for the team. Will a 40-year-old Chris Paul be worth $30 million a year? Probably not. Is paying Chris Paul that money then worth having him for the next two seasons? Yeah, so it balances out. Kyle Lowry at number nine. Three years, $85 million. This is the exact same situation where, yes, Kyle Lowry is going to be like 38 on the last year of that contract and be making $30 million but he's really, really good right now. He's probably gonna be really good next year and worth that money. And even if he has a fall off three, the third season from now, still not gonna be that bad. And it was worth it for those two seasons. The next one I will somewhat give you, Daniel Tice with the Houston Rockets. Four years, $36 million. Uh, he's making uh, $8 million a year. Uh, and they signed him at 29 years old. So the argument that he makes here, it is a weird contract to sign an average player to a long-term deal there when he's older and you're the Houston Rockets and you're trying to rebuild. On that end, I kind of get it. Granted, I think the logic of the Rockets at the time was to pair a big man next to Christian Wood who would allow Christian Wood to be less of a defensive liability, but it ended up having the opposite effect where sure, Daniel Tice might've helped the defense a little bit, but the offense was abysmal because Daniel Tice kept getting in the way and taking him out of the lineup ended up being the factor in them being much better. That said, uh, I don't think eight mil, again, not that consequential, $8 million and very tradable contract that a contender would probably try and trade for. So 
I think that was part of the part. Part of the logic was, hey, here's a placeholder, and then also we could probably get like a couple of second round, second round picks out of trading him. At number seven, Zach Collins with the San Antonio Spurs, three years, 22 million. Uh, yeah, it's a bad contract. Won't even argue with that. Zach Collins has barely seen an NBA floor in his career, and when he has, he's been nothing but pure medio mediocrity. So yeah, I, I mean, that was a pure potential signing but it's an overpay, so I'm not going to argue with you there. Duncan Robinson of the Miami Heat, five year, 90 million. Let me actually look up what the average salary that is because I'm too dumb to do math in my head. That's $18 million a year. You know, I would say Duncan Robinson last year when he was hitting all of his threes was worth about $15 million a year. So I'd say it's premature to make this assumption here. That said, Duncan Robinson has been a lot worse this year so with the power of hindsight i agree however i think it was wrong to say at the time that he wasn't worth 18 because i think it's a mild mild overpay and that's fine number five kelly olenek the detroit pistons three years 37 million which is about 12 million dollars per year while the pistons had the last laugh on 2020s similar stunning signings but jeremy grant history will not repeat itself with Olenek, uh, he had a great 27-game run with the Rockets last year, but the 30-year-old offers nothing when it comes to upside. My point of view, they signed him to be hopefully someone that can help Cade Cunningham in pick-and-pop situations, but also ultimately another guy who will long-term be a trade ship. I don't know why people act like uh, young teams signing veterans who can be pretty good is like a big deal. Oftentimes, these signings happen so that they can trade that player later on. Like, Jeremy Grant is probably going to get traded, and the Pistons are going to get a valuable asset out of that. Like, the main trade that I'm pondering right now is Patrick Williams going there. You're about to get a guy, if this trade hypothetical trade happened, you'd be getting a guy who was the fourth pick in the draft, and you're getting him for a guy you signed. So... It's a similar, you're not going to get the same level of value out of Kelly Olenek. But the point is, signing a player and then after a year, like, trading him, that's that's free shit right there. Like, it's the same thing. Uh, Kelly Olenek, there's probably a team that's going to trade a couple of second-round picks, maybe a young player who's not nothing. Uh, and that's worthwhile. So it's worth doing. Do it. <laughs> that's, that's why they did it. I don't think that's a bad contract at all. Um... Devontae Graham with the New Orleans Pelicans. Now, I read this whole section uh, in particular because I was interested by this. So, uh, four years, 47 million, and what he, goes is, what he goes on to say is this contract is not egregious for Devontae Graham, which is absolutely true. Uh, he's making about 12-ish million dollars per year. But uh, what's perplexing about the move is Alonzo Ball's departure because... Zion Williamson wanted Lonzo to stay, and it seemed like the Pelicans kind of forced him out. And not only that, they did not get a first round pick back. Now, he does say they sacrificed the future first for the right to overpay Graham. Did they trade a first round pick? No, they didn't. I don't think they traded a first round pick for Devontae Graham, did they? I'm going to Google that. Upon a quick search, I could not find... Um... I could not find if he was traded for a first round pick or not. And I would assume it was not one of the Pelicans first round picks. That'd be fucking insanity. Um, but this situation I would chalk up to semantics. So the whole Lonzo to Devonte Graham thing, probably a bad move, but the actual contract itself is not an overpay, but you overpaid for him in that you got rid of Lonzo ball for nothing and then got him instead, which is bad. So it's like, it was a bad decision, but the contract part of it wasn't the bad decision. So that's kind of a gray area, I suppose. Evan Fournier with the New York Knicks, I thought the contract was fine. Contract was fucking awful. So thus far, uh, this video hasn't had, or the, this article hasn't had any that drastically dumb takes. There's some stuff where I think you're overreacting. Um, Stuff where I think uh, the signing wasn't bad, period. Kyle Lowry, as well as Chris Paul, stand out the most there, where it's like, it's it's, it's the right move. So I, I, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with that contract whatsoever. 
Uh, and then Evan Fournier is a bad contract. Zach Collins is a bad contract. Devontae Graham is a bad move, even if the contract is not bad. And I will give you that Duncan Robinson ended up being a bad contract. But what proceeds is two incredibly, incredibly poorly aged takes. Um, number two, Jarrett Allen signs five years, $100 million, which means he would be making, which he is making $20 million in average salary. Uh, it takes a lot for a modern center to be worth a $20 million salary. Uh, the conditions have to be near perfect and they're simpler and they are simply nowhere close for Allen and Cleveland. For starters, the Cavs just used the number three pick on the player at the same position, Evan Mobley. Now, Cleveland fans will say that two bigs can share the floor in a Twin Towers model, but how will the Cavs have find the proper spacing with that front court? Um, thing is, they really didn't find proper spacing, but the defense is so good it doesn't fucking matter. Uh, oh, let's not forget Isaac Okoro, who's not a shooter either. Or that, or, or that despite spending consecutive top 10 picks on point guards, Colin Sexton and Darius Garland, the Cavs don't have the kind of floor general who will make the most of an imperfect offense. Well, that's exactly what Darius Garland has been this year. So this is just chock full of awful Lee age takes. Uh, for all of the holes that Mobley and Allen will plug defensively, they will create just as much congestion on offense. Allen is a rim runner. He is good at his gig, but in a primitive, but it's a pretty limited role. Teams don't invest. A, it's a pretty limited. I think I said primitive there. A role that teams do not invest a lot of resources in anymore. Allen surely had a market, but a nine figure one that is hard to imagine, which could mute his trade market if when Cleveland decides he does not fit with Mobley. So nine figure is in. $10 million or more? Absolutely. fucking lootly he had a market for $10 million or more. Are you kidding me? Uh, he had a market for like $18 million from other teams, I'm sure. And $20 million a year for a guy who was ever doing 17 and 11 on like 72% true shooting and being one of the best defensive players in the league, being one of the key components in the Cavaliers, being one of the best defenses in the league, and as a result, one of the better teams in the league out of nowhere, and I believe they're the fourth seed in the conference right now. Uh, Jared Allen is a good contract. Not only, not only is the take that this is a bad contract wrong, He's like a good contract. Like, this is a very, very good deal. Like, Allen's probably worth like $8 million more than he's making right now. So, bad take. But then we get to one that's even worse. Number one, DeMar DeRozan. Three years, $85 million. I'm not going to harp on this one too much because I talked about it at nauseum in that Bulls video. So, if you really want to see me go in on it, uh, go watch that video on top of some other poorly aged takes. But uh, just to cap this video off as simply as possible, DeMar DeRozan is the best player on the second seed in the Eastern Conference and I believe the fifth best record in the league overall. He is averaging 27, 6, and 4 on 60% true shooting and he is playing like an all NBA player, a borderline top 10 player. And for him to be making less than $30 million a year while doing all that, that's not only not a bad contract, once again, it's a steal. So, uh, well, I did not expect DeMar to play this good, and really nobody did. Even at the time, I was like, you guys are overreacting this contract. Same thing with Jared Allen. Both times, I was right. Doesn't always happen, but when it does, it makes me happy. And this take, or this overall article by uh, Zach Buckley, aged pretty shit. So, not that I'm a stranger to something like that happening. But yeah, I uh, wanted to react to this because I need content and I'm not going to be in town for the next week. But that is it. Goodbye.